when it comes to the kind of mysteries of quantum mechanics, I feel like the way that you, the, the explanation you offer in understanding, you know, this kind of systems holistic picture of, of, of reality effectively seems just to offer a lot of clarity as to these phenomena that are going on that doesn't come from an, a reductionistic understanding if you want to understand the individual right. particles alone. Did, was this for you a way into under, to thinking about the differences between reductionist thinking and systems thinking? Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, um, the, the basic uh, uh, characteristic of uh, the worldview, well, actually two, two basic characteristics of the worldview of modern physics. One is the fundamental interconnectedness and interdependence of all phenomena. When you go down to the atomic and subatomic world, there are no more isolated objects. You encounter a network of relationships. And whatever you call an object is something that you somehow isolate out of that network. You draw an, an artificial boundary, a rather arbitrary boundary, and then calls something, you know, an object, uh, a, a molecule, an atom, uh, an electron, you know, a, a Higgs boson to take another extreme. And, um, but these are not isolated objects. These are energy patterns that are connected to everything else in the environment. And in fact, they derive their basic properties from their connections to the environment, to, to other things in the environment. So this fundamental interconnectedness and interdependence is one basic characteristics, characteristic. The other one is the intrinsically dynamic nature of the material world. So these patterns, I call them energy patterns because they're patterns of activity. So the subatomic world is intrinsically dynamic. And I found both of these reflected in, in the Eastern worldview. And, uh, you know, as, as I wrote the book, by the time, you know, I finished the book, I uh, reflected in, in the epilogue that this worldview uh, of the Eastern spiritual traditions, which shows these great similarities to the worldview emerging from modern physics, is very different from the dominant worldview in our society, which is a mechanistic and a reductionist worldview. And so I, uh, I thought that, that physics would lead um, to a change, uh, you know, far beyond its, its um, discipline. And this is what I explored in, in my second book, The Turning Point. And what happened then was, I should, I should mention that during the 1960s, which were my formative period, I was uh, influenced not only by uh, spiritual traditions, but also by the social movements in the 1960s, <clears throat> by the student movement, the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, the, the so-called Prague Spring uh, resistance against you know, the communist Soviet Union. Uh, there, were, there were liberation movements, there was feminism, there were liberation movements within, uh, say, the medical field and, and so on. And, and there was a, just a very widespread questioning of authority and questioning of, you know, the social structures we were living in. And so I got very attracted to that. And, and so my, uh, my basic idea was uh, that the sciences have all modeled themselves after classical Newtonian physics. And now that we have a new physics, you know, quantum physics and relativity theory, it's time for the other sciences to take uh, uh, notice of that. And can they model themselves after the new physics? And then I, uh, made a big uh, shift, a big discovery, because I realized that the social issues I became interested in, like uh, 
uh, health, uh, social justice, protection of the environment, um, management of human organizations, uh, and so on, that these all had to do with living systems, with individual organisms, with social systems, with ecosystems. And I realized that physics has nothing to say about life. It cannot describe the very essence of life. And so I shifted from physics to the life sciences. I was very much influenced at the time by Gregory Bateson, whom I knew quite well and I had many discussions with him. And uh, uh, I, I tell you a, a funny anecdote in the way he pointed out to me that physics was really limited when it came to life. Uh, he came to very early on in around 1978, he came to one of my seminars. And then he said to a common friend, which was then reported to me, uh, he said, Capra, the man is crazy. He thinks we're all electrons. <laughs> and so with this very witty formulation, he put his finger on, on the dilemma that I had, that I was trying to model the life sciences, you know, after physics. And so, so my interest shifted and, and that's how I discovered systems thinking. You know, I read Ludwig von Bertalanffy's uh, general systems theory. Uh, I studied the writings of the cyberneticists, uh, studied self-organization, and then on to Prigozhin, Maturana, Varela, Bateson, of course, uh, Lynn Margulis, and various other uh, systemic thinkers. And uh, this, this began in the, um, in the 1980, early 1980s, and uh, went on for about 30 years. And I ended up with a grand synthesis of what I now call the systems view of life, which is uh, an understanding of life in terms of relationships, in terms of patterns, in terms of connectedness. Right. And so I guess the, um, the anecdote you just told, I guess, is a good um, illustration of, of the limitations of reductionist thinking, right? If you think life is just electrons, if it's truly in the parts, you, you can't explain the phenomenon, right? And the phenomena exist at the level of the whole system at a holistic level. 